Good morning to everyone joining us in Asia and a pleasant evening to those dialing in from the United States and the Western Hemisphere. We hope you and your families are all well and safe. My name is Regina. I'm a broadcast journalist and I will be your moderator for this session. Today's topic is policies for a green and inclusive, to support a green and inclusive recovery. Um, which is very relevant in today's world. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened things and really hit the poorest and most vulnerable groups the hardest. And so what we're aiming to do today is uh, talk about how we can all facilitate the transition to a greener and more inclusive growth. Uh, just to quickly run down the order of today's sessions, I'm gonna have each of my four panelists do their initial interventions after which I'll do a round of Q&A with them. And later on in the show, we'll have a little bit of time for audience questions. So do feel free to send in your questions via the chat box, and I will try to get to as many of them as time permits. And with that, let me bring in my first panelist today. I'm speaking to Dean Rachel Kite. She is Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Prior to joining Fletcher, Ms. Kite served as Special Representative of the UN Secretary General and CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. She was also World Bank Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change. She is currently advising the UK government as it prepares for COP26. Rachel, the floor is yours. Well, Regina, thank you very much. And to all uh, friends and colleagues uh, across Asia, it's a, a great uh, honor to be here at this uh, virtual annual meeting. And um, I wish for those of you who are in places ravaged by COVID-19, know that we're all thinking of you. Um, so good evening from, uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, this is really the uh, defining challenge of our generation uh, to be able to recover from the extraordinary impact, economic impact, as well as public health impact of uh, COVID. Uh, and in so doing, be able to vault forward uh, to uh, an economic pathway which puts us on course uh, for the resilience that we will need to the current impacts of climate change and those that we've already baked into uh, the Earth's systems and be able to move forward on a uh, lower carbon trajectory, one that will uh, allow us to arrive at the scientifically underpinned goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So the question really is, uh, do we have the leadership in place to be able to pull off uh, this extraordinary um, uh, act of, of intervention in the global economy? We often talk about the green recovery, but I think the politics of this are very clear, that if we, uh, that there is no uh, road to a green recovery, there's no road to a recovery, there's no road to a conference of the parties on climate change in November, if there isn't a global um, effort with extraordinary solidarity for uh, a global vaccination effort. It is difficult to imagine that we can get into the serious discussions about how to support countries in their transitions if we don't deal uh, first and foremost with this very present danger. So with that said, we have this opportunity, this opportunity to come together and make sure that the recovery is greener and more inclusive. This means that countries will need extraordinary help to uh, invest in their energy transitions, also in their transport transitions, in the way in which they manage land, forestry and their agricultural practices, um, and the way in which we manage the built environment. It means that we will have to put our hands inside uh, the engines, as it were, of the global economy at the national and global level. It means that we will have to price pollution effectively. We will have to deal with border adjustments and trade regimes which encourage a race to zero which everybody can win, as opposed to new barriers which will exclude people from global trading regimes. We would need to see a kind of collaboration between the United States, the European Union and China, which together account for more than 60% of global GDP. And we'd like to see that cooperation continue on climate change and deepen from the People Bank, People's Bank of China to the SEC and the Fed in the US to the European Central Bank and the new taxonomy at the heart of the EU law. All of this will have to happen while there are trade tensions, tensions on human rights, tensions on security and on technology. 
So colleagues from the IMF, I'm sure, are going to talk about the IMF central role here. But the pathway to the recovery includes, I think, three steps. First of all, that the SDR issue that was agreed at the recent spring meetings of the IMF uh, needs to be uh, quickly processed. It needs to include a rapid reallocation for those countries who don't need the resources that came with that issuance. And then that has to be dispersed or made available for disbursement into green infrastructure uh, in particular. We have to be really clear that uh, fossil fuel infrastructure and energy uh, isn't going to uh, help with liquidity or help with a road to net zero. It's going to come with attendant problems of uh, public health expenditures in the future as we have to then clean up air. But that means that there has to be a commensurate offer on the table for the kind of clean energy infrastructure which uh, is elusive at the moment. Um, the West is closing down the funding uh, of uh, coal through public development finance. Uh, this is now uh, including the uh, export credit uh, of uh, Korea, and we wait for Japan and, the, and China to indicate that they will not finance coal overseas as well. But rather than just saying we will not finance coal and watching the investor appetite uh, d diminish, we have to put on the table something uh, commensurate for, for green energy infrastructure. So what could that look like? Well, there's a central role for multilateral development banks and development finance in general. I think that we could open up the balance sheets of the multilateral development banks by syndicating some of the uh, portfolios, um, offering those to sovereign funds and others. This has been done in the past, but never at scale, and give the multilateral development banks and development finance institutions the capability to be more aggressive and to do more. At the same time, uh, we need to find uh, at scale ways for public finance to leverage private finance into uh, low income countries for clean energy infrastructure in particular. This means uh, bundling clean energy um, access into safety nets with public, but it also means using guarantees and pari passu uh, investment mechanisms, a bit like the asset management company wants at the IFC, in order to really bring private money that won't go uh, into these places on its own. India plays a very important role. It, it's not scared of scale, and perhaps its uh, investors would find opportunities across sub-Saharan Africa and across Southeast Asia and small island developing states. The one thing we don't have is time. We have lots of technical assistance, a capability. We have lots of ideas, lots of entrepreneurship, and frankly, lots of money, maybe in the wrong places with the wrong rules around it. The one thing we don't have is time, and so this will be a defining decade, and we'll only get one chance to bounce back from this terrible pandemic. We have to bounce back green. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful opener, uh, Rachel. Lots of uh, things there that we can pass through a little bit later on. But first, let me bring in my next panelist. Next up, we're speaking to Era Dabla Norris. Era is the mission chief to Vietnam, as well as a division chief in the Asia Pacific Department of the IMF. She led a recently published IMF report on fiscal policies to address climate change in Asia and the Pacific. And actually, she's been published widely on a variety of topics, including the political economy, labor, debt, trade, inequality, and gender. Era, please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Regina, and thank you to the ADB for hosting the event. Um, much of what I will say today uh, draws on, on the paper that Regina uh, mentioned. Uh, which was published recently. One of the main messages from our paper is that Asia Pacific is both very exposed to climate risk and at the same time a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change poses an existential threat to many small island countries and coastal areas in the region while also disproportionately affecting the poor. Coastal megacities such as Mumbai, Dhaka, Hong Kong, Shanghai are also at greater risk of flooding from rising sea levels. Next slide, please. As you know well, the region has also become a major contributor to greenhouse gases. And this is hardly surprising, given that Asia Pacific is home to the majority of the world's population and has been the main driver of global growth in recent decades. And hence, Asia Pacific as a region has a critical role in the global strategy for addressing climate change. Next slide. The second message of the paper is that raising the price of carbon can be a very effective way of reducing emissions. One way to achieve this is through carbon taxes. 
our analysis shows that even a relatively modest carbon tax of $25 per ton implemented collectively and gradually over the next 10 years can reduce regional emissions by over 20% and could easily achieve the region's overall Paris Agreement targets. That being said, a much higher tax would be needed to limit global warming to two degrees centigrade or less. Carbon taxes also have the benefit of generating potential revenues to compensate the most vulnerable and to finance priority spending, such as on health, education, and infrastructure. For example, a carbon tax of $50 per ton could generate annual revenue of around 1.4% of GDP for the region, which could be used to compensate those who are negatively impacted by a carbon tax or to fund a broader scheme to promote green investment or to address rising inequality or support adaptation infrastructure. However, depending upon country circumstances, a carbon tax may not always be the best or the most preferred choice and policymakers in the region can rely on a combination of tools. For instance, emission trading systems like the tradable performance standards introduced in China uh, this year, or Korea's uh, ETS, which was started in 2015, uh, um, could, could be implemented, although their coverage could be expanded. So-called fee baits that reward efficient uh, practices while penalizing damaging behavior can also help reinforce pricing schemes, such as Singapore's vehicular emission scheme. And green investment and incentives for research and development will also clearly need to have play a much larger role uh, uh, going forward. Next slide, please. For the region, it's not just mitigation, but also climate change adaptation, which is critical. Overall, as we can see in the left chart, we find that adaptive capacity of Asia Pacific region is broadly comparable to the rest of the world. However, that in itself is not enough, as this is also the region most exposed to climate hazards. As you can see in the right chart, it is the low income countries and the small island economies in the region that are the most exposed, and they also tend to have the least adaptive capacity. Investing in adaptive infrastructure can yield high returns as it reduces the damage and economic disruption from disasters and it can support a quicker recovery. But such investments are initially very, very costly. Our research estimates that the investment needs for climate-proofing infrastructure are around 3.5% of GDP annually for the region and during the next, next decade. And the amount could exceed 5 to 10% of GDP for some of the smaller Pacific Island hubs. Low-income and Pacific Island countries are particularly vulnerable and need to invest in protecting infrastructure and making their water resources more resilient and improving early warning systems for natural disasters. Yet, for these highly vulnerable uh, economies with limited fiscal space, I should add, more so due to COVID-19, these large investments could be very difficult and challenging to accommodate without concessional loans uh, or donor grants. This brings me to my last, but perhaps most important point is also highlighted uh, by Rachel, namely that tackling climate change is really a global effort. The IMF is helping by integrating climate in our annual country assessments, by scaling up our capacity development to help countries integrate climate into their fiscal strategies and to improve the effectiveness of their climate investments. We look forward to working even more closely with countries in the Asia Pacific region on these fundamental challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ira. And by the way, I apologize for butchering your name. It's Ira Dabla Norris. Thank you so much. And we'll circle back to some of your points later on. My third panelist for the day is Yasuyuki Sawada. He is the Chief Economist and Director General of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of the ADB. Before joining the ADB, Sawada-san was professor of economics at the University of Tokyo, focusing on development issues, including disasters, health, and poverty. Yasu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, Rachel and um, uh, Era uh, mentioned that uh, both uh, public and uh, private resources are necessary in order to finance and support 
green recovery. So here, I'd like to uh, discuss the role of uh, private uh, uh, resources. Um, first, I'd like to mention Asia's uh, rapid growth in the past decades took a uh, grow, grow first, worry about cleanup and uh, equity later approach. In recent years, uh, this uh, conventional Asian growth model have been changed. But uh, uh, then pandemic uh, set us back. Uh, we now have an opportunity to build a greener and more inclusive Asia. Um, having said this, uh, building back better requires a large amount of uh, capital. As uh, you can see from the chart, uh, Asia needs to invest 1.5 trillion US dollars or 4% of regional GDP annually in order to achieve SDG goal by 2030. As Ira noted, uh, fiscal space uh, has shrunk, however. Uh, the region's fiscal de deficit doubled to 10% of GDP last year, and public debt uh, rose 10 percentage point, up to 65% uh, of GDP. This means private capital needs to play a bigger role. Green and social finance does this um, and by mobilizing uh, private capital towards uh, SDG investments. Fortunately, green and social finance have expanded quite rapidly, and uh, Asia leads among uh, emerging markets. Asia accounts for one fifth of global green bond issuance, the blue bar charts on the left in this um, uh, slide. And also, right chart shows the excluding multilateral institutions. Asia is now second largest social bond market after Europe. One important driving force of this uh, uh, quite fast expansion is changing stakeholder preferences. Uh, more investors now want their investment to perform well, but also a force for good. Currently, one third of all investment uh, uh, managed globally, about 30 trillion, 30 trillion US dollars, is guided by environment, social, and governance, or ESG objectives. On the supply side, uh, firms are tapping green and social finance in order to protect against sustainability risks, and also in order to attract the so-called patient investors, generating greater resilience through downturns like the current uh, pandemic. And there is evidence uh, that green and social finance generates positive environmental and social impacts. Analysis in our Asian Development Outlook report released last week uh, found Asian firms improved their environmental performance scores by 30% over two years after issuing green bonds, as you can see in the left chart. And also cities that issue green bonds saw significant improvements in air quality leading to health benefits. Innovative implement, very innovative instruments like impact bonds contribute to positive social impacts uh, the right-hand uh, chart it illustrates a typical social impact bond, which allows private investment to share the risk of green and social investment with public sector or donors and also a service providers. One example of a social uh, impact bond is the Educate Girls Development Impact Bond uh, in India. Then what the policy uh, can do? Asian governments can force the growth uh, 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 of uh, green and uh, social finance development uh, through uh, legislation, regulation, and various fiscal instruments. Legislation and regulation can guide um, uh, private capital towards SDG. Policymakers should enforce standards for information disclosure and impact assessment aligned uh, with the international best practice in order to assure investors uh, that investment deliver on their uh, promises. They should also incorporate sustainability risk into micro and macro prudential frameworks to safeguard financial uh, stability. And governments can uh, strengthen market infrastructure and ecosystem for green and social finance. At the same time, public finance should be, uh, should be strengthened uh, through domestic resource mobilization, uh, as Ira already mentioned. Together, uh, these will promote adequate instruments in SDGs. I will stop uh, here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Regina. Thank you so much, Yasu. I'm going to come back to you on those uh, social impact bonds later on. But first, uh, let me introduce my final panelists for the day. I'm speaking to Nui Thi Khan. Ms. Khan founded the Green Innovation and Development Center, or Green ID for short, which works to promote sustainable energy development. Her collaboration with the Vietnamese government to design a long-term sustainable energy policy led to her receiving 
the 2018 Goldman Environmental Prize, which is the so-called Green Nobel. Ms. Khan, please proceed. Thank you, Regina, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it is my great pleasure to join you today in this uh, panel. And um, I am so happy to share with you our work, um, how we do in the last 10 years to promote the green development and uh, inclusive um, uh, and, uh, purpose in Vietnam. Uh, as you know, we work on sustainable energy and since 2011, uh, I found Win ID, and at that time, I recognized that uh, uh, the the one will move in the new direction. Otherwise, we cannot stand or suffer uh, anymore because of the so um, intensive degradation of environment. So, uh, when we form the organization, we focus on how we uh, should work with the multi actor and partnership in Vietnam and the Mekong region to support for the shift to uh, the green solution and um, the pathway to uh, build back and also to avoid the catastrophic environment at the same time ensure the growth. Um, so we work with a lot of um, stakeholders uh, in the country and at different sub-national level. We build the partnership and we share information. We share our uh, research and we uh, recognize that data and uh, evident uh, base uh, is uh, play a very important role in supporting for the new direction uh, to, and also for green growth. Um, we were, we uh, produce a scenario for the power um, uh, sector and we propose an alternative scenario uh, for more share of renewable um, and also less coal dependent for the country. And we bring that data in the public to discuss with decision maker at the party level, at the national assembly level, and also at the government level. So the way we uh, communicate and the way we engage is uh, a way uh, one to ensure that um, all the actors who have a seat in the decision making process uh, receive our information. So, um, and uh, over the last 10 years, I see that uh, Vietnam has moving uh, in the right way. Um, we have a champion on green growth from not only the government side, but also from the um, citizen, from the business, and also from the sub national level. Uh, we see that when the information is um, there, and disclose to support for decision maker, uh, a lot of change has been happened. I can give an example of how the sub-national level take decision to like um, to move forward with green growth. Some province in the Mekong Delta, after receiving information from scientists and also they have their own analysis, they recognize that if dependent on corn development, we destroy their uh, agriculture, their um, uh, seafood uh, production. So they propose uh, the central government to withdraw corn project in their province. And that decision uh, start from one province and now it become the champion and the, uh, the attractive um, uh, location for wind and green uh, energy development. It is Bạc Liêu province. And then this the message from Bạc Liêu send the uh, encouragement for the other province in the Delta uh, to do the same um, uh, action. So I think that uh, the champion can happen anywhere, but especially in our context, the local level is much more um, um, uh, active uh, in moving for green growth. And um, I see that um, IMF and uh, ADB is as a multi um, 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 a bilateral um, uh, financial institution instrument. It can support a lot for the green growth and the de uh, inclusive development uh, in the context of we are facing with the double challenge, double crisis, both uh, climate and uh, um, uh, COVID-19. I expect that uh, more support from um, the, the bank will support for not only the central level, but also the sub-national level um, uh, partnership or action to move forward to green and also inclusive development in our country. 
in the coming year. And also, I think the last point I want to highlight is that we really need um, the platform for the sub-national um, um, level to interact, to share experience, and to take action uh, in our um, moving forward to green and inclusive development. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Khan. All very great points as well. Um, at this point, I'd like to bring in all back all my four panelists so we could uh, get right into the open forum. So many uh, interesting points there I want to follow up on. Uh, Rachel, I want to start with you. I think your best place to give us the big picture perspective. You talked about um, China and Japan needing to stop financing coal powered plants. And I know that there was talk of that as well in the recently concluded um, climate summit that U.S. President Joe Biden convened. Um, can you give us a better idea of how big this problem is and how well hopeful you are that th these countries will actually get there? Thank you. Yeah, so at the Biden uh, Climate Leaders Summit, um, the, it's sort of the tightening up of the 2030 targets that countries um, are committing to, especially the major emitting countries, uh, on their path to their net zero co com uh, commitments for 2050 is really sort of the political guardrails on this sort of race to zero that, the, that we're all in now. Um, and coal really has no place in the race to, to, to zero. So the question is, what is the support to countries to transition quickly away from coal? And so uh, it, there's no real political space or scientific space really to finance coal overseas. Um, uh, so within your nationally determined con contribution as a country, obviously you have to phase out coal yourself, but then you can't really be, fa be financing it overseas as well. And I think especially for low income countries who have large energy access gaps or don't yet have reliable, affordable, clean energy, then um, saddling them with technology which is going to be obsolete within 20 years uh, when perhaps there are better alternatives and we should be helping uh, them invest in their clean energy uh, mix is sort of really, I think, a, a priority. So Korea uh, announced that it will get out of funding uh, coal overseas, which leaves Japan and, and China as the major investors of coal overseas now. We would expect that before COP26, they would have to clarify that they are indeed um, going to step back from that. And I think that the People's Bank of China has already indicated um, that it's putting some, some new uh, sort of um, yeah, guardrails around its own uh, its own thinking around that. So this is kind of absolutely essential. But as I said, it's it's not enough to just say we won't finance uh, uh, coal. It's what will the G20 in particular uh, come to the table with uh, uh, as additional support for the clean energy infrastructure. And I think that the the conversation now is around what kind of bridge, I mean, how long, how short. Uh, and in which parts of the world is, is gas the, the, the right option. Uh, for many countries without a gas infrastructure, um, the leapfrog to a renewable future seems to be uh, perhaps more attractive financially. Uh, that means that we have to help with that. Uh, and then I think the final uh, point to say is that for those countries with already existing fossil fuel sort of infrastructure and with gas infrastructure, the absolutely urgent thing uh, and this is where the international community has to help as well, is stopping methane leakage, uh, either leakage through um, uh, through the actual infrastructure of pipes itself, uh, but also uh, through ending uh, gas flaring. So there's lots to do. Finally, the, there, there is an extraordinary uptick in interest in green hydrogen, which can use the gas infrastructure. Um, and obviously for, for Japan, Australia, uh, for other countries in the region, this is a very important part of their strategy. Um, this is also an important part of the strategy in North America, but also in Europe as well. So we, we need to be investing in uh, low income countries' ability to participate in these parts of the energy infrastructure of the future, more than um, uh, selling them um, obsolete technology that we wouldn't use um, a, a, as a short term path to energy security, which actually won't deliver that at all. 
think that's a really great point. I mean, it's not just uh, good enough for them to commit to stopping financing of coal-powered plants, but also the execution is really going to be key. Uh, but of course, any sort of change uh, entails risks. And now, Ira, if I may go to you on this, how does one manage risks um, on the path to cleaner energy? And by risks, I mean, uh, you know, all sorts of attendant risks, like um, labor displacement and um, rising energy costs for households and firms and uh, others, uh, geo specific geographic impact, which actually you had already pointed out in your report. Uh, thanks, Regina. So as you, as you correctly pointed out, a higher price for carbon would necessarily mean higher energy. And this could have a you know, myriad attendant effects. So protecting you know, vulnerable people and communities, firms, workers, during the transition to low carbon economies will clearly be critical for all countries. And here I'd like to make three points. First, the distributional impact of say high, higher carbon taxes or any changes in energy prices who to protect, who to compensate, will necessarily vary across countries. For example, I mean, our research shows that a carbon tax, if implemented, would be moderately regressive. In other words, it would disproportionately be borne by the poor in China and in Mongolia, but it would be moderately progressive. In other words, it would be disproportionately borne by the rich in India and the Philippines. Second, our analysis shows that households, workers and firms that are vulnerable to higher energy prices, they can be largely identified and they can be compensated. And this can be done in a way that even produces an overall positive effect on equality. In India, for example, our analysis shows that recycling the revenue from a $25 uh, a ton carbon tax to finance, for instance, a universal transfer for all households would still leave 80% of the households better off, and it could actually reduce inequality in the aggregate. In other countries, uh, our analysis suggests that existing social transfer schemes could be expanded to cover vulnerable groups. Third, countries can actually put in place policies to ease job transitions. For instance, displaced workers that are employed in the affected sectors could be supported by extending unemployment benefits or by retraining and, uh, and, and re-employment type of services. Higher public uh, spending, for instance, on clean public uh, infrastructure can actually be job rich and, 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 re and result in net new job creation in low carbon uh, sectors. I mean, ultimately, putting people first will really help garner the kind of public support that is needed for climate policy, so that for sort of the, the magnitude of transitions that we're talking about. And it will also help ensure just and fair transitions to low carbon economies. Thank you, Ira. What I'm uh, getting from that is uh, there's really no one size fits all solution, even for um, a sensible concept such as a carbon tax. So in that, in that vein, let's home in on a particular country. Let's talk about Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam, of course, is one of the fastest growing economies in Asia. Um, but alongside that, its energy demands and needs have, you know, exponentially increased. Um, Ms. Khan, can you give us a better sense of what it's like on the ground, um, whether there's enough awareness and concern over the country's energy future, or it's still a, a growth at all costs mindset? Yeah, thank you for coming back to Vietnam. Um, I am happy to share with you that um, yeah, over the last three years, uh, the energy sector in Vietnam witnessed a so exciting movement. Um, it's so that um, what we have now for related to the solar uh, booming and the solar uh, uh, development in Vietnam um, is this uh, have great contribution from the, the society from the business community. And the, we also see that a very good direction from the party with the resolution number 55, because uh, we as a um, uh, observer, we see this the resolution uh, is an open door uh, and um, it's the, like, um, a very strong tool to, um, uh, to support for the moving towards the uh, um, 
the green development, especially in the renewable energy uh, sector. And a decision by the Prime Minister uh, number, um, 11, uh, number 11, 11 and number 13 uh, to support the solar um, um, incentive is also um, attract a lot of investment for this um, um, area. Um, uh, when it uh, increased uh, um, and uh, so strong support for green development. So um, even the planner insisted that the country need uh, to view more coal, but I don't think that public uh, one is and public um, show uh, the, the evidence from uh, the existing coal power area that uh, is not uh, the, the right choice for the future. That is the reason why from civil society, we are trying our effort to convene, to show the evidence and also to uh, propose uh, um, the alternative way of developing uh, our future energy um, uh, sector. And uh, we have, we, I also see that there are uh, uh, the, the growing interest from the business community, not only from the supply side, but also from the consumer side. Um, just to share a very recent evidence, I just organized a, a, a workshop um, in Ho Chi Minh City with small uh, and medium business community. We expect to, uh, in, uh, to have a 60 um, business uh, representative, but uh, more than 100 <laughs> come to meet us and they ex ex uh, express their um, interest in how they can join in the green uh, transition and how they can make their business become more greener. And even some propose that, oh, I want, I have idea and I want to make a green factory or green industrial zone. So I see it's the very great moment for the, uh, for, for, for the people in Vietnam uh, to work together with government and with a development partner to build back and also to see how we can make the, the solution, the technical solution become realistic. And um, I totally agree with, um, uh, with, with um, um, uh, Kate Erasure that we have a, a lot um, of solution technically, and we have a lot of finance, but maybe it put in the wrong side, but we don't have time. So I think that is very dry moment for people um, not only um, globally, but I see that in Vietnam, we are very keen to see how the, the green development um, should look like and uh, can be enforced um, in the coming time uh, to leapfrog from our like fossil fuel dependent uh, to the cleaner future. Uh, I, 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 I see that um, not only the native people, yeah, the citizen, uh, but Jutes also uh, are very keen to this. Uh, it have a survey from UNDP. Uh, it showed that the public are willing to pay more for having clean energy rather than coal. I think that's a strong signal for decision maker and for business and, uh, and community and the supplier uh, to see how the future should be designed uh, to um, to meet the expectation of the Jutes. And this is also our uh, the owner of, of, of the future. You know, I have to say, uh, it's so good to hear that legislators uh, in a Southeast Asian country are so forward thinking in terms of their energy future. Um, I'm sitting here in Manila in the Philippines right now, and I don't think those conversations are happening here yet. Um, all right, mm -hmm. so we've tackled the green recovery part of the program. What about the inclusive recovery bit, right? Um, and Yasu, I've got my eye on you now. Uh, in your view, what are the two or three key things that we need to get right in order to make sure that the recovery from out of this pandemic is gonna be uh, more inclusive, especially considering that the last 12 months have really devastated uh, some communities here in developing Asia? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, asking a very important question. What's the key elements behind uh, possible inclusive recovery? I, I would say uh, digitalization is uh, one of the most important uh, keys to achieve uh, in inclusive recovery. Uh, as we all uh, are aware, uh, pandemic really accelerated transition to the digital economy. 
and also pandemic highlighted contribution of digital services, online meetings like us today, and also uh, online education, telework or work from home arrangement, e-health. Despite the containment measures, um, uh, here I'm also sitting in Manila uh, and uh, under the uh, uh, probably the longest lockdown around the world. But still, uh, because of this uh, digital uh, platform and services provided through uh, uh, digitalization uh, economy, uh, we can continue uh, somewhat, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 our jobs and uh, 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 shoppings and uh, also education. So digitalization is really uh, the uh, probably the most important keys. Uh, and uh, according to our study released uh, uh, in February uh, earlier this year, uh, Asian Econ Integration Report, we had a sp special chapter uh, focusing on digital platform. In that uh, chapter, we actually estimated uh, gain, overall gain out of this uh, digitalization will be enormous. Uh, for uh, developing Asia, uh, 1.7 trillion US dollars over uh, next uh, several years and also a uh, uh, generation of uh, new uh, jobs, uh, enormous jobs, 65 million uh, new jobs or so uh, we can expect if digitalization progress uh, effectively. Uh, having said this, I think uh, there is another, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Another uh, dimension is a digital divide. Online uh, education uh, in a sector of uh, education or, or schools, uh, those who can swiftly uh, switch from a face-to-face uh, instruction, schooling to uh, online education. I think digitalization generates um, enormous benefits. But um, uh, again, uh, lots of studies shows, uh, including ours, um, um, uh, there are a sizable number of students who cannot really uh, swiftly uh, uh, switch to uh, online education and also uh, having uh, uh, difficulty to access uh, uh, online uh, uh, lectures. So I think um, uh, digital divide is a really uh, important uh, 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 you know, issues uh, government and uh, officials uh, should tackle. Uh, not only in education sector, but also um, um, uh, in businesses, uh, micro enterprises who cannot uh, join uh, online platform, uh, they cannot gain out of this enormous um, uh, potential of uh, digitalization. And uh, jobs and labor market uh, for those who can switch uh, swiftly uh, switch to um, uh, uh, work from home arrangement, digitalization uh, provides a, a really a large uh, economic uh, dividends. But um, uh, there could be um, uh, there has been uh, lots of people lagging behind and uh, being unemployed because of the uh, uh, stringent containment measures. So how to tackle um, uh, uh, digital divide? Uh, at the same time, maximizing the benefit of digitalization. I, I think that's a really a key uh, to achieve an inclusive recovery. Uh, uh, some concrete examples, I think governments, uh, also ADB can help uh, uh, upgrade the digital infrastructure in order to make uh, infrastructure, including internet access, more accessible and affordable. And also uh, for, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, micro enterprises to be included in digital platform uh, business. Uh, fair competition policy will uh, play a key role, uh, especially for um, uh, micro and small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. And, and then at the same time, uh, we need to put uh, extra care to tackle a potential privacy issue and cybersecurity issue in order to maximize the uh, benefit of digitalization. So I would say uh, digitalization is a key for achieving uh, uh, inclusive recovery. Thank you, thank you very much. Over, uh, Regina, thank you. Digitalization is the most important thing. But actually, Yasu, you brought up a very good point there, uh, if I may latch on to it. Uh, inequality through edu through education, which is really stripped bare during this pandemic. Um, and I, I saw that in your latest uh, Asian Development Outlook report, you mentioned this or also the long lasting and inequitable impact of the long school closures brought about by COVID-19. What were your findings? What kind of impact are we talking about? And how do we address this? Uh, yes, uh, our analysis um, um, just released last week as a part of Asian Development Outlook finds that students have already lost nearly one third of a year of worth of learning. This is um, um, uh, because of prolonged school closures in the region, because uh, remote learning from uh, for many students is uh, hindered by lack of access, proper access to computers and the internet. So I think that these learning losses uh, translated into substantial reduction uh, in students' future uh, earning capacity and lifetime uh, uh, income. 
uh, today's students uh, stand to uh, lose, uh, according to our study, average of uh, $180 per year, or two or more percent of uh, decline in expected future earnings. If we aggregate up total uh, estimated losses for the whole region, then uh, 1.25 trillion US dollars, or 5% of regional GDP, that's an enormous loss um, uh, arising from this uh, lack of a proper uh, 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 new modality of uh, uh, education. So I think um, um, uh, you know these uh, losses will be uh, even uh, larger if uh, uh, longer school remain closed, bigger the losses um, um, uh, generated by this uh, school closure. So I think uh, uh, four strategies uh, basically we can be pursued. Uh, number one is uh, we need to bring COVID-19 under control really as soon as possible so that all students can safely return back to in-person instruction. Uh, so I think um, uh, in this uh, respect, um, uh, rapid implementation vaccination program is uh, really the key. Secondly, reopening of school should be considered in areas where um, 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 uh, 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 local transmission has been sufficiently low. Uh, until pandemic fully uh, disappear, student safety uh, should be maximized by uh, uh, staggering uh, daily schedules, grouping students in pro uh, protective uh, bubbles, uh, building hygiene facilities and encouraging uh, uh, precaution behavior. So all the package together, I think uh, reopening of school uh, should be considered at this stage. Number three is a program for uh, returning student must be managed to ensure students can catch up uh, and uh, uh, you know um, uh, uh, bridge this uh, lost learning effectively. So I think uh, a new type of a low cost learning diagnostic tools and uh, student uh, tracking, as well as uh, materials uh, to enhance effectiveness of uh, teaching. That's uh, very important. And then fourth, uh, uh, finally, uh, but not least, uh, where physical reopening is not yet feasible, I think we need to really improve coverage and quality of remote instruction. So um, um, uh, on offline education should be combined, uh, not only through uh, internet, but also uh, 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 TV-based or radio-based. Um, uh, in the Philippines, there is a hybrid uh, uh, education has been already rolled out by a Department of Education. So I think um, uh, uh, combining a different possibility together um, for those who cannot really uh, return back to education, uh, we can support uh, their learning uh, progress. So I think these, these are the four points really needed in the um, uh, uh, area of uh, uh, schooling and education. Thank you, thank you very much. One third of the school year gone and $180 per year in future earnings lost. I tell you, Yasu, as a parent, these figures will keep me up at night. All right, uh, let's switch back to the green recovery uh, side of things for a bit. And Rachel, I guess this question is more for you. Uh, how likely do you think it is that developed economies, rich economies, would uh, will make good on their commitment to extend uh, support to countries most vulnerable to climate change. And let me explain for a second where that question is coming from. A few days ago, the, the finance secretary here in the Philippines issued a press release calling on rich economies to, uh, well, honor their commitment to extend financial and technical support. Essentially, he was saying that the lion's share of our NDCs in the Philippines, the nationally determined contributions, rest on that support. Your thoughts, please. Well, this is a year of extraordinary sort of climate diplomacy, which is in the climate sort of convention discussions in the run up to the Conference of the Parties in November in Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, but also be because we are in this extraordinary moment of recovery and because we know we are so far off track and so need to uh, move to an energy transition and other transitions that will put us more on the right track. Um, the climate discussions take place now in the G7, in the G20, uh, centrally in the IMF spring meetings, the bank spring meetings, and of course here at ADB. So it's it's become the mainstream issue. Uh, what I what I think is that um, it's also clearer as a result of the pandemic that there's only one planet. There's sort of you know we need the rising tide to lift all boats. There's no scenario whereby um, the the resilience of a of a developed country can be achieved without uh, taking care of uh, the, the rest of the world. And of course, there is a, 
uh, a moral um, uh, uh, element to this as well, which is that uh, the, the dilemma that we find ourselves in now as a result of climate change was caused by the industrial processes of, of the advanced economies. Um, I think that uh, the UN is looking to see whether or not that, that, solid, that sense of solidarity, which is emerging from people, especially young people, is something that uh, governments, uh, rich countries will respond to in the way in which they allocate aid. Um, so that there, I think there are three things this year. One is that, uh, and the, 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 the government of the Philippines is correct in that one thing that has to happen before the conference in Glasgow is that those uh, commitments that were made uh, more than a decade ago uh, for public financial resources to support the transitions of uh, low-income countries, uh, least developed countries, uh, small island states, etc., has to be made. A promise made has to be a promise kept. And so there is this totemic discussion of $100 billion a year, every year, uh, which should be in the uh, Paris Agreement uh, follow-up. And then the question is, going forward from now until 2030, it should be more than $100 billion a year. So what should that be? And will that commitment be there? But more important than that, in, in sort of ter in, in, in economic terms, is the way in which the rich countries um, do uh, find ways to spur investment, make the technology available, uh, share the uh, the insights of digitalization, uh, so that you can achieve uh, hyper efficiency, uh, and use real creativity to to spur the energy transition and development. So that's about creating green hydrogen markets around the world. That's about making sure that offshore wind is as available in Southeast Asia as it is uh, in the North Sea. It's about uh, really embracing um, decentralized renewable energy, especially solar for small island states and for rural communities. It's about bundling uh, access to clean energy and clean cooking in particular into safety nets uh, around the world. And I could go on and on about it's about electric mobility, two wheelers, four wheelers, buses and trucks in every city in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and East Asia. So um, uh, there is a race to zero. It's a strange race in that we all have to win. We all have to cross the finishing line. It's not a race where you come first and everybody else uh, is second and that's okay. Um, and I think that uh, investors understand that and the publics are beginning to understand that. Uh, and now we need politics, which is as good as our science. I like that analogy. We all have to cross the finish line at some point. Um, at this point, actually, I have to start taking questions from the audience. Um, and I have one here, and I guess this is a question for everyone. Subsidies for renewable energy, yes or no? So we know that the costs for uh, solar and wind uh, energy generation have come down to a point where they're actually competitive with traditional sources. Um, and so do we need massive subsidies moving forward? I guess um, for this question, I'm going to go first to you, Ira, and then maybe Ms. Khan. Uh, thanks, Regina. Uh, I think it's a very it's a, it's a very interesting question. I think the way I like to think about this is that you know governments definitely have a critical role to play in encouraging private sector innovation that will reduce emissions and, and boost adaptation. And in here we can think of you know a, a variety of things that governments can do. They they can government support could take the form of basic research, which is very relevant for some of the lower income. Uh, countries in, in Asia. It could take the form of public-private uh, partnerships. Uh, it could also take the form of subsidies to encourage, you know, private low-carbon uh, R&D. And, and renewables is, 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 is one uh, uh, area. Um, alongside R&D, uh, governments could try to uh, mobilize financing or to subsidize, to uh, uh, provide subsidies to support new low-carbon technologies. So it's not just renewables, but new low-carbon technologies, especially in the hard to decarbonize sectors, such as heavy transportation or steel uh, and cement. The, the issue with, with, with subsidies uh, for uh, renewables is that, you know, the, the, there is definitely an externality that we're trying to address. Uh, in some countries, the, the, the challenge has also been that there has been overinvestment and some of this has been wasteful. So how, how do you calibrate uh, you know, incentivizing innovation and 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 and, and investment uh, in in a particular sector, and sort of discourage, say, overinvestment and, and wasteful spending. So I think that's sort of a, a you know a critical uh, a question that policymakers uh, uh, also face. And so you know, sort of striving for greater investment efficiency, and also in in terms of allocation of resources, is, is an important question 
uh, for countries and policymakers. So we need to prevent the leakages. Ms. Khan, any thoughts on this? Yes, uh, I totally agree with uh, Ira on on the points uh, you uh, mentioned. Um, the role of the government in designing the scheme to support for uh, new low carbon technology. Um, in this case, um, I also want to highlight that uh, yes, uh, investment in research and development, uh, and also um, taking care of um, the scenario and giving the, the, the right signal for investors to consider, um, I think it's very important role the government should play. Um, and I agree that, um, yes, we need to have uh, some level of subsidy for the new markets or new technology uh, to ensure that it's attractive for investors. But how to, to ensure investment efficiency is very important. Uh, what we learned from Vietnam and regarding the solar booming recently, I think is the very good lesson learned for for many other countries. Um, so I believe that um, if we can use the right tool uh, and policy, it can um, guide the, the the right direction. Otherwise, it will lead to a wet investment. Um, and, and, be, uh, and also learn from Vietnam. Um, Besides the subsidized scheme at the beginning, uh, we also need to have a clear roadmap for for the the, the, the direction of the policy. So uh, subsidize it uh, it never um, uh, like uh, forever. Yeah, that is not the right way <laughs> to build the market. It needs a, a certain um, periods, but after that, what it is. I think that is very important uh, that um, the investor need to know, and um, I think it need to be well, more well prepared uh, from the the policy maker um, for that. Um, and uh, if when we talk about the inclusive, I think that uh, even for some uh, low carbon technology is major in the market, but for some vulnerable group. If we want to ensure the inclusive and uh, ensure the equal asset, it still need uh, some kind of like uh, subsidy or supporting mechanism to ensure that um, they are involved, uh, they are they got they get benefits. Uh, I want to highlight like, in Vietnam, even we have a very high rate of like uh, uh, electrification, but for the last my group, they are very vulnerable, and with the clean energy nowadays. We, we can help them to have a faster access to clean energy. And without the subsidy for that group, I think that it will be very challenging for them to be able to 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 have the energy access um, and it's clean. So so subsidy uh, yeah, for some time at the beginning of the market development, but also is uh, should be designed to support for some specific and the most vulnerable group in the society. Um, so that is my point. So government subsidies still work, but efficient disbursement is going to be key here. All right, let's look at the other side of that coin. Um, Michael Bloomberg and the CEO of Goldman Sachs recently put out an editorial saying that um, we need to mobilize the capital markets to fight global warming with money. He says, ultimately, government help is great but we need the private sector to actually see commercial opportunities if we are to get to net zero. Um, I want your thoughts now, uh, I guess, first to Yasu and then to Rachel. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'd like to um, uh, explain uh, the uh, potential of a private market to finance uh, not only green, but also inclusive uh, 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 impact uh, investment um, uh, from the angle of uh, 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 social impact bonds. And um, I'd like to a little uh, a bit in detail explain what, how um, impact bond works. And um, uh, I touch upon uh, Indian example, Educate Girls Development Impact Bond. Um, uh, uh, this is um, uh, done by an investor, UBS uh, Optimus uh, Foundation, uh, which provided uh, 270,000 US dollars in working capital to Educate Girls, which is a service provider implementing the program. Uh, the target outcome of uh, this uh, uh, impact bond 
uh, was the uh, improved uh, girls' uh, enrollment in, at school and also learning performance. After three years of implementation, uh, outcomes were evaluated by um, independent evaluation firm, uh, ID Insight. And uh, this evaluation team found uh, out of school girls among the out, out, out school girls eligible for the employment, uh, enrollment at school, 92% were already enrolled, exceeding the um, initial 79% target. And also students in the program uh, villages uh, exceeded uh, learning performance targets by the wide, uh, wide margin. So with this uh, very impressive outcome achieved, the investor was repaid by uh, outcome uh, payer, uh, the Children's uh, Investment Fund uh, Foundation. Uh, its full initial investment uh, of uh, 270,000 US dollars plus 15%, uh, one five percent of internal rate of return. And um, uh, so this is one another example in the area of uh, social uh, impact bonds. Uh, in the current market, there are many popular uh, uh, green and social finances instruments, uh, such as uh, impact bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds, and sustainability linked bonds. I think uh, in order to scale up uh, already a rapidly expanding uh, market, I think uh, uh, in order to scale up uh, capital and boost the demand for uh, these instruments, uh, further development of market infrastructure and ex ecosystem, this should be uh, streng strengthened uh, further. And um, uh, finally, I'd like to mention uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, social impact uh, uh, instruments, uh, I think um, uh, social impact outcome uh, sometimes uh, quite difficult to measure. So well-defined impact merits uh, can help ensure the success of uh, these uh, social finance uh, uh, markets and the investment. Um, so very important uh, to set the common standard for information disclosure, third party evaluation, uh, in order to help avoid the uh, uh, misstatement of outcomes and boost uh, investors' uh, confidence. So I think there is a broader market infrastructure uh, 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 and also ex ecosystem. Uh, we can envision further uh, uh, expansion of uh, green and the social investment uh, market. Yeah, thank you. This is a very important uh, uh, point. Thank you. Very good insights. Yeah, so yeah thank I, you for that, Rachel. Well, I I, I would agree with you, Asasan, that this is uh, the structural elements of this are absolutely uh, fundamental. So I, uh, so first of all, I mean, of course, it's correct that uh, that this won't happen. The transition won't happen without um, private finance, without the capital markets two things are happening one is that you're beginning to see uh, around the world regulators become extremely uh, sophisticated in their understanding of climate risk at least and the uh, network for green uh, 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 financial systems which is a, a collection of more than uh, 50 central bank governors and central banks around the world uh, doing a lot of research and work on this you have a conversation going on between the People's bank of china and the eu over aligning taxonomies for sustainable finance. Uh, the new Biden administration now is very clearly sending signals from the Federal Reserve, uh, from the SEC and from Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury's office, around their seriousness of using every lever that they have across regulation uh, from banking to other financial services through to the economy to try to um, be very clear about the direction of travel. Uh, you have movement around uh, transparency that uh, financial institutions from banks to insurers to asset managers and asset owners will have to be transparent about how much, how they are holding carbon uh, on their portfolios and how they intend to manage through uh, the uh, transition. And that's also true for, for private companies. The leading edge of the capital markets is moving very fast. It's divesting from fossil fuels. It's asking very uh, pertinent questions of companies. And you're going to start seeing now, I think, and this was indicated again last week, uh, the uh, a number of investors asking really pertinent questions of of board members about how they uh, are thinking about climate risk uh, for the companies that they serve. So that's moving quite quickly. Um, and I think that for banks like Goldman Sachs, uh, the uh, investment, the investors in Goldman Sachs are saying, well, you know, you explain to us how you as a bank uh, think you're going to be helping to manage uh, the transition. So uh, I think there's pressure on uh, private capital, it's especially in some parts of the world. 
And then let's face it, Goldman Sachs is, is not uh, a, you know, a deep investor in the kinds of clean energy infrastructure in emerging markets, uh, which is where we really need to see a, a sort of uh, Marshall Plan size mobilization of, of capital. And so that's why for the multilateral development banks and those who understand emerging markets and who have feet, feet on the ground, who understand country risk, technology risk, uh, project risk in these kinds of uh, investment climates, they must play a very important role in bridging, uh, you know, Wall Street, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, uh, Frankfurt to the emerging markets, as well as, and of course, a responsibility to mobilise domestic capital uh, in these countries themselves. So I think if we all stood and waited for J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs to come and rescue. Uh, that that isn't going to happen. It, 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 it's a perpetual uh, conversation within development finance. Uh, I think the thing is we have to build the bridges, the guarantees, the uh, the uh, syndication of the very good green assets that sit on the uh, books of the multilateral financial system uh, and find a way to bring uh, sovereigns and uh, large investment banks into the opportunities. And I think the only thing I would say, final word would be, it's, it's, I think we shouldn't juxtapose the idea that the brown economy is a growth economy and the green one uh, is one where which has to be subsidized and which, you know, is risky. There is transition risk, but um, uh, cleaner energy um, is, is better for us in, for many, many, many reasons. Emissions is only one of them. It's better for us in terms of health, the number of people who die every year from not being able to breathe clean air. And uh, our economic systems, our GDP measures, are uh, blunt instruments in really understanding what we value. Thank you. Just very quickly, Rachel, to your point about investors beginning to ask questions, do you think there's enough long-term interest uh, over, uh, for example, uh, Yasu's products, the social impact bonds, green bonds, or is this just a sign of the times? Is this just a fad? No, I, I think the green bond market has exploded in the last uh, six years. Really, it's it's. I mean, I remember going to Davos in twenty in January of twenty fifteen, so eleven months before Paris, uh, and I was then working for the World Bank, and we said that we hoped that by the end of that year, the green bond market would be at between forty and fifty billion, and we were kind of laughed at uh, at that time. And and look at the size of the market now. Um, and so I think that that uh, train has sort of left the station that's going. I think what's also interesting now, uh, and colleagues from the IMF and others would be better able to talk about this, is even a, a conversation now within central banks about um, about uh, whether or not there is a market neutrality over green uh, uh, as opposed to brown uh, growth and assets. So if we know that we need to de deeply decarbonize over the last over the next three decades, um, as a central bank, are you neutral in your view around brown and green? And wouldn't you actually want to stimulate uh, green bonds, green assets even further? So I think that these structural conversations have started and they will intensify. Maybe I could just come in, uh, Rachel, if, if there's just uh, just just very go ahead, just, just to add. Yes, thanks. So I, I think you know one of the biggest challenges that the private sector faces is sort of poor quality or you know availability of ESG data and analytics, and this is a big barrier to broader uh, implementation of sustainable uh, investment. And I think from the perspective of emerging markets, you know, sort of standardization, reporting of climate risks and financial statements. Is, is still you know, a big challenge. And only with accurate and adequately standardized reporting of climate risks can investors you know, discern what the company's actual exposures to climate-related uh, um, financial risks are. And, and you know, these kind of climate change-related disclosures, uh, these objectives that fall outside the realm of typical firm investor type relationship, like monitoring and mitigating the adverse consequences of climate change or financial stability, so, so I think there is, you know, clearly a very important role, as, as, as Rachel and Yasu pointed out, for uh, international uh, uh, coordination, particularly to facilitate convergence towards global climate-related standards uh, and, and, and disclosures. And there's, there's an important role for the IMF and other uh, multilateral development banks uh, in this area. 
Actually, that is what I take away from this session. Uh, everyone has a role to play. Government, uh, think tanks like uh, big banks like uh, IMF, ADB, uh, the private sector, citizens. Um, I could talk about this all day with you guys, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So with that, we're going to close out today's session. Uh, thank you so much to our esteemed panelists, Ira, Rachel, Yasu, and Ms. Khan. And thank you so much to our audience for tuning in as well and enjoy the rest of the annual meeting.